Welcome everyone to Methods in Sinology, a lecture series that concentrates on research methods rather than results. Um, I'm very excited because this is the very first lecture in our series. And uh, let me introduce uh, the people who are behind it very quickly. Uh, I am Mariana Zorkina, and uh, I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Zurich. And I am the founder of the series. And then with me, there is the co-founder, uh, Magdalena Poli, who's also a PhD student, but at a different university, University of UPenn. Today, we start with the very distinguished guest uh, who will talk about uh, Chinese poetry in Japan. And it is Professor Richard John Lin. Uh, Professor Lin has defended his PhD thesis on Wang Shijian as critic and poet in 1971 at Stanford University and has since worked and taught in a multitude of universities, including Indiana University, Stanford University, University of British Columbia, University of California, uh, University of Hong Kong, National Peking University and University of Toronto. Uh, he has a very wide range of interests and uh, so many publications that it would take a whole hour just to list the most important of them. So I will just uh, list some of the research topics he has worked on. So they include, for example, poetry and literary criticism from Song Dynasty and up to late Imperial China, including research on Wang Shijian, Zhu Xi as literary critic, and on uh, Chinese poetry and Buddhism. Uh, this, of course, includes uh, many, many translations of uh, poetry in classical Chinese. Uh, he has also worked on perception of Chinese poetry in Japan. Uh, he translated Yi Jing and Tao De Jing. And among his interests are also Chinese soapstone carvings and snuff bottles. And uh, as someone who is uh, using digital humanities, I'm especially excited to see that in the 80s, uh, he has even worked as editor for Chinese Japanese Korean database project. And uh, his recent translation and study of the uh, Guoxiang commentary to Zhuangzi is now in copy editing for Columbia University Press. And it is planned to be published in spring 2022. And he is very prolific in his work. And there are two more projects he's working right now as well. Uh, one of them is a book on Huang Zunxian and his literary experiences in Japan. And he will partly talk about this today. And the second project is on aesthetics of uh, Shi Hua painting stones that are cuttings of marble stone, which were quite popular in China at some point. I hope I didn't miss anything. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Professor Lin, please. Okay, I'll start. Thank you for this uh, generous uh, and uh, overly uh, enthusiastic uh, introduction. I do have a wide range of interests, uh, and uh, I should probably tell you why this happened. It happened uh, because of a rather ridiculous reaction I had to I, one of my teachers was F.W. Mote, Fritz Mote at Princeton. And uh, back in the um, 1960s, he, he wrote a large state of the field for the Asso Journal of the Association for Asian Studies. And at that point he said, well, we no longer have to know everything. Uh, we now am to the point in, in, in Chinese studies, East Asian studies in general, that we can be disciplinary. And we don't have to do everything the way our uh, predecessors have done. And I thought to myself, no, I am gonna continue to do everything, which is rather ridiculous. So I wound up uh, working, well, really, as long as something's written in literary or, or classical Chinese, Wen Yin Wen, you know, I've worked on it. So it's from the Yi Jing, the Zhou Yi, until here's Huang Zongxian at the um, end of the 19th century. Well, um, let's start at 
with this man. Uh, I got interested in Huang Songshen largely because I was asked to do a review article of Jerry Schmidt's book on, um, on, on Huang Zongshen. It was published back in the uh, late 90s for the uh, journal um, China Review International. And I was so unhappy with the book, um, both with Jerry Schmidt's style of translating, which I found to be far too um, loose paraphrase in, in nature. And, but I was particularly unhappy about his treatment of Huang Zongshen in Japan. Um, and so I got interested in Huang Zongshen because of um, this, doing this review article. And I have a, a list uh, of, or I rather have a bibliographic um, um, source for that in a slide, in a, in a few slides later. Anyway, Huang Zongshen uh, was a very interesting man. Um, and we're also in the age of photography. Now for someone who has worked as I have in goodness, um, for years and years and years in pre-modern Chinese sources, this is a real novelty to be working in the age of photography. And now with the internet and the resources that we have on the internet, the, the access to such sources that one can get a really um, intimate look into the world of experience of the people involved in your research project in a way that just wasn't possible. I mean, we. You know, it's, it's kind of ridiculous to say so, but I've been working on Guoxiang in um, the fourth century, third, fourth century, uh, his commentary on Zhuangzi. Uh, there, it's, it, we know hardly anything about him. Uh, here with Huang Zongshen, not only we know everything about him, far, far too much to handle in a monograph, for instance, and we even have photographs. Here's a formal portrait. Now, there are two basic editions. I suppose this is where anyone should start in working with, with a poet, is to get a very clear idea of, of the sources involved and uh, the differences among them. And what are the general sort of areas of interest that the um, poet covers? Well, in this case, um, these seem to be, I've, I've extracted these from, uh, the translation work that I've been doing with the poems in those two editions, they're all together 214 poems. And I've so far translated about uh, 120, 130. And these seem to be the categories that he's particularly interested in. And he is interested in this, not for necessarily literary reasons whatsoever. As you can see from the list, this is really intellectual history or uh, the history of Chinese Japanese cultural relations. That's how uh, Huang is studied in Japan and now for the last generation, at least uh, studied in, in China. Identification of the Japanese with the Chinese people. All of this was, um, Huang was a reformer. And he was part of the, the Liang Qichao, you know, reform movement of the Guangxu era that was put to a, an abrupt end in 1898 with the, with the palace coup of the Empress Dowager, um, uh, supported by Yan Shikai, and that put an end to it in 1898. He was almost, uh, if he were arrested, he was in Beijing at the time, if he had been arrested, he would have been executed along with uh, hundreds of others. Uh, unfortunately, he was um, took refuge in the home of a Japanese diplomat whom he had befriended years earlier when he was in Japan. His um, collection of poems and then later his um, work on Japanese history and the Urban Guoji, the treatises on Japan, the first uh, history of Japan and written in Chinese, um, the, the subtext of both was that the Japan modernization movement, the Meiji Restoration, was a model for China and that China ought to follow it. And to convince people of his day, he started collecting poems that he had written uh, that grew out of his experience 
of his time in Japan between 1877 and 1882. And so he, the poems uh, uh, are particularly interested in these topics, identification of the Japanese with the Chinese people, we are one people, um, the long history of China-Japan relations, Japan different, but within the pale of Chinese culture on both the popular and elite levels, not just, uh, you know, Bunjin Wenren levels, but also popular culture. Chinese and Japanese share a common high culture, of course, which uh, the Siwen, this culture of ours, I borrowed the term from Peter Bowles. Uh, he invented the term about 30 years ago by now. And in um, Japanese, it's pronounced Siwen, or Shiwen, sorry. sorry uh, shi, shi, shibun, I'm kidding, my language is mixed up. Siwen and Shibun. And the description of scenery and historic sites, uh, that it's different from China, but not too different. Japanese institutions and public space, descriptions, critiques, and quotations for reform and modernization. Um, the, he, Huang was very, very interested in public space, uh, which was at a minimum in, in China. Uh, that is public institutions, museums, hospitals, public parks, and the like. And then modernization in its cultural expression, the tradition modernization dynamic rather than dichotomy it's a dynamic and it, he explored both aspects uh how to preserve tradition in the course of modernization how to modernize by yet preserving tradition now huang's attitude um of uh, in his contributions began in earnest in 1875 with the ascension of the guangxu emperor Besides practical efforts as diplomat and civil official, he wrote these two great works, the Urban Zashishu and the Urban Guoju. Um, and these works, of course, as I mentioned, grew out of his experience in Japan as counselor to the Imperial uh, Chinese legation. This was the first foreign uh, legation, the first embassy that the Qing Imperial Court sent abroad and it was to Tokyo. Um, impressed with the Meiji Restoration is the political subtext of, of both the historical work, the Urban Guoju and his poems are the promotion of reform in China with the Meiji Restoration as its model. And his association at, was um, very intimate and for the most part, on a personal level, very, very friendly with the leading political leaders in Japan. Even though the embassy that was sent to Tokyo in the first place was there to enter into negotiations over the Ryukyu Islands and Korea, both of which were uh, contested areas of political uh, influence uh, contested between China and Japan. And they were disastrous eventually for the Chinese point of view. The Japanese got their way over both. And Huang's position on this is outlined in a, in a formal uh, essay that he wrote, submitted first to his ambassador, He Zhang, and then made its way uh, to, uh, via channels to the Japanese foreign office that China and Japan should unite together to withstand the pressure of Western imperialism. And they were particularly interested in those days uh, with the threat of Russia, Imperial Russia in the Far East. And um, well, it didn't happen as we well know. And there is a tragedy in the making and eventually it unfolded in that direction. But in the meantime, we had this very friendly, uh, Wenren Bunjin Circle uh, in Tokyo, uh, in which Huang himself participated and some of the very highest ranking officials in Japan uh, took part in as well. Now, here are some of them. Uh, this is the man who uh, welcomed the Chinese when they first arrived in Japan um, in late 1877. They came by ship from China, 
And they first uh, came into Yokohama, which was linked by a new railway to downtown Tokyo, uh, close to the uh, other embassies, the Imperial Palace and the Japanese uh, official buildings. Um, they tried that for a while. And this was a man who um, first met them and became quite close friends with Huang Zongshen himself. And I've, these photographs of these Japanese figures uh, are quite interesting. Um, the one on the, the far left here, this is the same man, uh, aging as, as as goes on. I could probably have tracked down a photo of this man in uh, in his old age, but uh, anyway, here is a, as a boy actually, when he was a uh, court page or something at the imperial court. This is in before the the restoration had occurred, and uh, his father was a high ranking official in the court of the imperial court that the Chinese emperor or the Japanese emperor at this time was in Kyoto, in Jingdu, not in Dongjing. Dongjing was still uh, uh, Edo, um, uh, Jianghu. Uh, he then participated in the restoration and eventually wound up as a very high official uh, chief secretary in the foreign office. Now, um, I've got all of this information about the negotiations. And what's important is that there was a clear distinction between his relations with these uh, Japanese guests on a political or an official level, uh, distinguished from his personal relations. His non-official relations were extremely cordial and mutually rewarding. And then the works. But before we get that, a, a word about this uh, whole project. Um, one of my teachers at Princeton was Marius Jansen, who was a, um, a historian and spent much of his career studying the Meiji Restoration and largely from its uh, dominant discourse perspective, that is Westernization and modernization. He thought that Huang Zongshan and the people he associated with on a personal level, it was sort of a dead end. They didn't go anywhere. They were the kind of cultural conservatives who are more interested in preserving tradition than in advancing the progress of modernization and uh, westernization. Uh, so this in a way is, is, is a study of a, of a sideline or a marginalized aspect of history. Uh, it's certainly not the main theme of Meiji Japan studies. Nevertheless, I think it's important because it, it reveals some very, I think, poignant um, um, experiences of intellectuals who were interested in, in things of a real humanistic nature, not necessarily political or even to be approached from a social science point of view, but certainly a humanistic point of view. So here's uh, the editions. This is the first edition, 1879. It comes from Seneta Bunko, the Seneta Keishu collection. Professor Seneto is probably the foremost, or was, he died in, in, in 1985, uh, the foremost scholar of Chinese-Japanese cultural relations in the 19th century into the early 20th century. Uh, he, he had no immediate following in Japan, but he, his works are now being quite uh, uh, assiduously uh, explored by both Chinese and Japanese scholars. Uh, the work was uh, published by the Tungwen Guan in an official publication of the Foreign Languages uh, Tung Liaman Affairs uh, Office. And here's the title page and the year of publication. And um, here immediately in the next year, there were other editions published in Japan. This one, <coughs> excuse me, has a punctuated and with Japanese uh, uh, um, reading uh, notations, how to read it in Japanese word order, which I have never learned to do. I thought it's just crazy to turn 
classical Chinese, literary Chinese into Japanese word order, it seems to be um, a, a very difficult and roundabout way of doing it. But uh, Japanese works were done at this time. And a word should be said for those of you who don't know it, um, this Japanese Chinese literary culture in the later 19th century in Japan was ubiquitous. Every educated person not only could read literary Chinese, they could compose in it, including poetry, um, much like in the old days, and maybe even still in some cases, um, Oxford, Cambridge undergraduates, you know, being able to compose uh, uh, Greek, ancient uh, poetry and ancient Greek and, and, and Latin and so forth. Okay, this is the 1898 edition. This is the larger, the revised edition. It was finished in 1890, preface is dated, but Huang had trouble getting it published by the Tunglin Guan. By that time, there was a real opposition growing within official circles in China leading up to uh, the 1898 coup. <coughs> But um, he did get it published in Changsha, where he had become part of the progressive uh, provincial government at that point. <coughs> Sorry. The um, modern works, these are the three most important works. And I suppose this is the next stage to go once you determine the um, editions to be used in, in uh, research. What's available among modern contemporary works that are particularly helpful? Uh, this edition in um, the the Zoxiang Shijie Zongshu series um, is uh, published in eight in 1985. This uh, includes um, a punctuated, um, simplified character Jentizi version of all the poems, the the 200 poems in the. Um, there are 154 poems in the 1879 edition. There are 200 poems that, and then overlap, of course, a great deal in the 1890 edition. And in addition to that, the, the, the Guangzhou, the expanded commentaries, what this means essentially is um, a, a correlation of the commentaries that Huang wrote to his own poems included in the 1879 edition with the similar in, entries, which are much larger, it sometimes in the um, urban Guoji, the history of, of Japan that he also wrote. Sine Takeshu and a collaborator, Toyota Minoru, published a complete translation of the 200 poems and the poems that were not included in the 1890 edition, but were in the 1879 edition. Uh, they it, all of them are there, and this has gone through many printings. It's still in print in Tokyo, the Heibansha, which is one of the largest Japanese publishers. Uh, it was first done in, in 1943 during, during the war, and more recently, beginning in 1995 and continuing to this day, is a group at Kobe University, Shenhu Dashi, Kobe, Dai, Kobe Daigaku, um, a group which consists of both Chinese and Japanese scholars who work at the Department of Chinese Literature in Kobe University. Th this comes out in, in, in installments published in a local journal published at the university, Mimei, Weiming. I suppose they got this from Weiming Hu, uh, which is on the Beida campus, of course, uh, not yet named, <laughs> waiting for a name. Anyway, it's, I find that very helpful too. These are the three works that I use uh, as secondary literature helping me in my work. Now, this is how I got started in the first place, the review article of Jerry Schmidt's book. And then I wrote various uh, uh, articles uh, which associated Wang Zongxian with both movements in China and Japan and uh, cultural intellectual history. and Finally, is the work that I'm doing now for Oxford University Press. It's in their new translation series of, of classical Chinese works. Uh, I'm particularly happy with the 
uh, Royal Asiatic Society. They gave me an award for this. It was rejected. I, I was part of a conference at Rice University in Texas in Houston in the journal Nanyu. It was rejected because it wasn't theoretical enough. Anyway, I decided, oh, I'm not gonna change anything. I'll try to publish it somewhere else. So I took it to the, the Royal Asiatic Society of which I am a member and they published it in 2007 and then I won the prize for it. <laughs> so much for lack of theory. Now, let's go on to some general considerations about translating Chinese poetry. Um, this is almost archeological. It's, you know, it's from the 1970s, 77 and 78, how long ago this was, though it, to me, of course, it seems rather recent. There was an exchange in the Journal of Asian Studies uh, between May 77 and August 78, uh, involving three people, um, Jonathan Chaves, um, Ed Schaefer, and me. I first uh, brought out this uh, review article and um, Chaves didn't like a lot of it in it, so he responded with a rejoinder. But unfortunately, he used an expression that he claimed Professor Schaefer would say, now I advise any young scholar, don't go after some established older scholar and expect to get away with unscathed. Um, and you'll see what happened to Jonathan, who is a good old friend. And Schaefer, Ed Schaefer uh, was a colleague when I taught at UC Berkeley uh, briefly in the 1990s. Anyway, this is how it eventually evolved, this exchange. I complained about Chave's translations being too much of a paraphrase and that he ignored the grammar. Well, this set off a controversy, um, largely um, along these lines. If you, I'm not gonna read this. If, I'll leave it on the screen long enough for pe people to skim it at least. Um, I maintain for the high tongue style in particular, that a lot of, of verbs in Chinese are causative, putative, um, and not simply transitive, intransitive. And that um, instead of trying to uh, construe um, verb object word order, we have something far more complicated going on. And it's the, you know, word order is all important. And without it, there's chaos in effect. Or as Chaves would have it, so much ambiguity and arbitrary word choice on the part of the original Chinese poets that an English translator, for instance, <coughs> uh, sorry, a bit dry throat this morning. That it's, it's so arbitrary that an English translator can rearrange the word order any way that he feels is right. And Chase has done this largely his whole career with usually rather good results. But he's very sensitive to this and he argues about it. He has argued about it for most of his career, not only with me, with Schaefer, but with other people as well. Anyway, here is um, the essential issues involved. Um, and I, you can look at these, um, um, let me go back. You can look at these up, here are the references to them. They're easily found, uh, especially if you have uh, internet connection to the database for the Journal of Asian Studies, they're easily had and you can download them. Um, this is where he starts to argue with Professor Schaefer and claim that 
Schaefer, uh, if we follow Schaefer, in fact, we end up with a truly, you know, too many causative verbs that result in, in, in um, bizarre readings. Um, I don't think they're bizarre at all. I think they're often mostly rather interesting, far more interesting than what he does by rearranging it into a rather more, um, what would you call it, vernacular narrative style of translating. Now, um, this is Schaefer's response. Now I'll leave that on the, the screen for a few minutes that he attacks, re, you know, in a rather, rather clever way, I think, um, Chave's position. Now, I'm gonna move on. Um, I hope this is all available later uh, since it's being recorded and you can stop the recording and read this at more at your leisure. This is, um, a good example that sums up the problem, I think, succinctly. So Dufu's poem. I would translate it this way. Mud so plant, it keeps swallows flying. Sand so warm, it puts to sleep mandarin ducks. Now this is to respect the word order that we get verb object, verb object. Now, I think Jonathan has translated this rather differently. He would say something like the, the mud soft uh, swallows fly. The sand, warm is, the, the sand is warm uh, on it. Uh, Mandarin duck sleep. Well, this is to rearrange the word order. And I think the result is perhaps, uh, well, it's, it's, it's possible, I suppose, but it seems so flat compared to this rather lively. The idea is the mud is so pliant it keeps swallows flying. Why? Because swallows build nests out of mud. And it's in a perfect condition for um, gathering by the birds that they take advantage of this moment of, of um, convenient gathering. So they keep flying back and forth to the mud banks to get the mud. And the sand is so warm that it puts them to sleep rather than they simply sleep on it. Anyway, this such syntactic constructions and notice that it's also extremely uh, strictly um, parallel in the constructions, one line to the next, these causative verbs and strict parallelism. Now, these seem largely avoided by Huang Zongshan himself. This surprised me. I, when I got into preparing this part of the presentation, I went back and, and skimmed through all the translations I had already done, and I just uh, couldn't find any. And I realized that, that Huang was really, um, and then I thought, well, what kind of tradition of poetry was Huang Zongshan working in? Well, he was working in the um, expressionist, the Xingling Pai from the Qing dynasty that's associated with uh, 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 Yuan Mei, and then before him, the uh, Gungan Pai, the, the Yuan brothers in the end of the Ming. And they in turn, championed Song Dynasty poetry, especially the late rather vernacular prosy kind of poetry of Yang Wanli and so forth. Well, um, I think I've come up with a, a, a conclusion that, uh, that this kind of, of uh, Tang Dynasty compressed, highly um, involved uh, syntactically um, rigorous uh, poetry. Uh, this is one of the characteristics of the Tang style, and Huang Zongshan simply didn't work in it, being in the roughly Song Dynasty style of writing poetry, composing poetry. 
Anyway, I went through all the poems in Huang Zongshan and I came across one that might, but isn't uh, an example. And it occurs in the second line, okay? Well, here we do have a verb before a possible object, but it doesn't really work because the cesera, which is important, it's 434343, and it is rather parallel in that sense anyway. And it really belongs to a phrase that ends here. And I did it this way. And lyrics of lovely spring sung as a string of, of attributes. It, it's on spring outings, so young people. And he, he calls them Xiao Yu Xian, the little roaming transcendence. And I prefer transcendence following the habits of our Taoist uh, scholars these days. They've rejected the the old fashioned immortals, because it, not, it doesn't exactly mean that. Transcendence is the preferred way with them, and so I've adopted it myself. Anyway, that's the closest we could get, and even that isn't supported by the structure of the lines themselves. And this, by the way, is how the poems will be presented in the Oxford University Press book that I'm preparing. The, uh, the main poem number is the 1890 edition. The one in brackets is the number of the poem in the 1879 edition. That's if the same poem appears in both editions. And this one happens to do so. And this is followed by Huang Zong Shen's own prose commentary. Um, it must have occurred to him quite early as he developed this, these poems that it would need a great deal of explanation for a Chinese reading audience. This one doesn't necessarily, but um, many others do which, because they contain Japanese uh, place names, personal names, um, references to Japanese history, all of which would not have been familiar to his contemporary Chinese audience for which the poems are of course presented. Following the, uh, the Huang commentary, translates this, uh, occurs my own footnotes, tracking down allusions and so forth. And that's what happens here. And here is the Kobe group. This is how they do it. Um, this is the turning it into uh, literary Chinese, Japanese, which helps at least to um, punctuate and uh, how it scans and, and, and how it's divided up into grammatical syntactic units. Um, then he translates the, the prose into, uh, over here, he just trans translate, they translate the, the, the prose passage with explanations. Uh, it's all helpful, but it's not the last word. It's just one step towards you know, the uh, final version that, that I myself am working up. The Kobe group is far more um, detailed, in fact, too detailed. They track down every reference, uh, which many of, much of which I think is superfluous, so I don't use them all. Uh, and they do one thing that is helpful in some regards, but it's hardly a translation. That is, they paraphrase in modern Japanese what the lines of poetry mean. Um, it's helpful, but it's not a translation. Um, and this is uh, common, of course, in China too, the da yi, the, the general idea approach where you turn a poem into kind of a prose paraphrase. They're all very interesting and helpful, but they certainly aren't translations that try to preserve the syntactic structures of the original. And it goes on. It's number 113. Okay. Now, um, a novelty for me is uh, being able to visit places in Japan where all of this came from. And I came to this temple um, at 
the northern edge of Tokyo on a trip a few, um, quite a few years ago now, where a tombstone is erected, which is a tombstone for the entombed poems. Um, and that means the draft of the poems that Huang Shen wrote. And it's in a, the grounds of a temple. That's this temple. This is at the extreme sort of metropolitan edge of Tokyo out in the country really, but it's still connected to downtown Tokyo with, um, the, uh, with the public bus system. Now, the, see this is number four. This is where that little thing is, that little tomb uh, stone. Um, and it's there because of the man whose pub, whose tomb is here, way in the back. That's this man, uh, Da He Ne, Hui Sheng, his grave. That's Okochi Teruna in Japanese. And this is the inscription on that stone, which is uh, off the path and there's a, a little bamboo fence barrier. You can't get close enough to see it closely. Anyway, this was a rubbing made back in the 1940s. And this is the transcription. It's, it's, in, it's in literary Chinese. So it's easily read. And this is a translation. Now, it's written by Okochi Teruna. That's this man. And it's an expression, or it's rather an account of how the poems were written and why this, this tombstone was erected. So I'll give you a moment to look at it. The most important thing about it is that it's in a tradition of burying um, a literary work, this uh, Leo Tui's literary works, or famous calligraphers' brushes when they've worn out, give them a decent burial. Anyway, this is what was done by Wang Zung Shen's, at for Wang Zung Shen's poems when he completed the first draft and it went off to the publisher, the Tongwen Guan in China. Now he refers to him continually as Gong Du. Gong Du is the, the, zi, the personal name of um, Huang Zongxian. And the, the um, inscription goes on. So apparently there was a party and um, uh, we were half wrapped with wine, ban zui. Uh, I remember talking with my own teacher, Huang, uh, Liu Royu, uh, James J. Y. Liu. I remember he asked me, you know, what do I thought about a, a polite way to to say drunk when you're when the, the term "zui" appears, say in poetry, and we settled on wrapped with wine. I hope that works to be half wrapped with wine, so you're feeling jolly and and kind of high with the drink, but not too much of it. Anyway, um, this is how the inscription ends. And the people who attended this party um, <clears throat> are largely people from the Chinese embassy, as well as some of, of, of uh, the other Wenren or the Bunjin circle that um, uh, Huang belonged to. Now, this is Mr. Okochi Terana himself. He was a very influential man for a time in his own day. He was a, a, um, a lord of a large fief, the Tokugawa regime um, in, uh, that governed Japan. 17th, 18th, and, and half of the 19th century. Um, 
ran a rather feudal system in large domains were had domain lords and he was one as a very young man he inherited and here he is in that garb with his samurai sword and he um, decided to use the wealth of his domain which was a very wealthy one it's north east of tokyo to uh, modernize he uh, put together a modern well-equipped western style army standing army, I think of 5,000 men, and hired a French captain of, of artillery to, to, to run it. And uh, for a time, it looked like he might have been against the restoration, the revolution, and would try to protect the Tokugawa uh, regime, of which he was a sworn follower, but he didn't. He threw his lot in with the with the um, reformers, and um, briefly became head of the new Meiji government army. Here he is in a military uniform, and then he becomes a Chinese style scholar. When he was the leader of the um, or the head of the uh, thief. He had an income of 10,000 bushels of grain, of rice. After he, the, the restoration and all these domains were turned into, into uh, provinces, he was uh, like the other leaders of, or the domain lords, they became governors and his salary was 500 bushels. And he decided it was not worth it. Now, this other photo is his son and his wife, a photo taken in the 1920s. And um, Okochi Kiko um, is important in this story because he knew about the massive um, Hitsudan, Bitan, brush talks that his father had kept recording all the conversations and experience uh, describing the experiences over about five years, which included Huang Zhengshan. These have all been published recently in China. They were preserved in uh, the rare book collection of Waseda University in Tokyo, but they had been preserved originally after this man's death, he died at, uh, in his late 30s of alcoholism. He was a terribly uh, bad drinker. And he died in 1882, the year that Huang Zhengshen left Japan for his next posting in San Francisco as consul general there. Um, it's almost as if he had nothing else left to live for because he had, so, had such a, an intimate um, cultural relationship and friendship with uh, Huang Zhengshen. Anyway, he had kept this enormous drove, you know, it's, it's 10,000, it's, what is it? Eight, eight huge bound volumes. It's here on my shelf, I can't see it. It's at, in the corner over there. Um, there's about 10,000 pages of this stuff on the backs of menus, um, scraps of paper, all sorts of things. Anyway, these were preserved out in the temple, but when, Sanita Keshu was studying all this back in the 1940s. Um, he was puzzled because it was this, this uh, uh, steely inscription, uh, inscribed steely in the temple grounds said that on the banks of the Sumida River, the Sumida River isn't anywhere near this temple. It's actually um, uh, in downtown Tokyo. And um, he went actually to visit the son of, of, um, of Okochi Terana, Okochi Kiko, and asked him about it. And he said, yes, that was here in our garden. Uh, but when the house was destroyed in the 1923 earthquake, the Kanto Great Earthquake of 23, where much of Tokyo burnt down as well as being destroyed, that's the one where Frank Lloyd Wright's 
uh, Imperial Hotel survived where everything else fell down all around it. And then the developers tore it down anyway in the 1960s, late 60s. Um, that's another story entirely, of course. Uh, anyway, he said, well, it used to be here, but we moved everything out to the temple where he is buried. And by the way, I think there's a lot of his um, um, old books or something out there too in the storage room. So Sinead Keshu went out there uh, during the war years. It took him hours to get out there and um, found that there was indeed this, this huge pile of, of of, of um, stitched volumes, tsatsu in Japanese. Um, but they, many of them were, were moldering away and being eaten by bugs and whatnot in a very damp um, uh, stone uh, storage place. And I've seen some of this uh, in the original. Uh, I, I saw they're all preserved in Waseda University. And it's interesting that many of these pages are, are bug eaten around the edges, but the main part of the page is intact. And that was because a big leaf of tobacco was placed between the pages and that fended off the bugs and preserved it. Anyway, he took all this stuff back and he was a professor of history at Waseda University in those days. And he um, and it's preserved there and now published. Now, when the Chinese first arrived in Tokyo, they arrived and, and they stayed, they thought they could conduct business from the ship they came on in Yokohama Harbor and commute by the new railway into Tokyo. Well, that they gave up that idea because it was too time consuming and inconvenient. And so they moved into a, the Yuejie Zengyuan, the Gekkai Soyin, the Moon Realm monks' quarters, and that was in the precincts, the general belongings of the great uh, Pure Land Buddhist temple, the Zengshangse, the Zhoujoji, in Shibaku, uh, which no longer exists. It's Minatoku now, uh, Hanganku, um, the, the harbor uh, district. Anyway, this is a contemporary photo of the late 1870s. Uh, really, it's out in the country there. And this is another shot from an angle. And, the, and this is the main temple from a 1901 map. Uh, and this is the main, the, 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 the Zhengman right here. And their um, uh, residence was over here, the Chinese embassy. In, 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 but it's now by 1901, they sold off land for a factory. This is the graveyard that was attached to the, the, that part of the temple, the sub temple that was used to be here at this point. And this is a poem that Huang Zongshen wrote about the, that place. Um, here where towers fit for immortals rise into space. These are the, the great Buddhist temples, uh, buildings. Gale force sea winds blow strong enough to knock houses flat. With the sound of waves on all four sides deafening the ears, it's like living all year long amid giant white caps. Well, and then he goes on in his prose, much rain and especially a lot of strong wind. The place I live in is constructed you know, with glass and four sides. So when the wind starts, it rattles and shakes. It's like being on the open sea that the heart, the heart, one's heart thumps with alarm. Well, uh, we went there. Uh, the temple is still there. All the land outside it has long been turned into something else. Most of them are um, official business, government buildings. And, but it's a long, long way from the sea, from Tokyo Bay, because of the landfill over the, overall the, the, the 20th century. Uh, and it's quite far from the ocean now, but then it wasn't. The reason why the Huang was sent in to find a place for the embassy to move to, and he found this, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure of the mechanism that's involved, but this isn't the first time it was used for a foreign um, embassy. Uh, 
or legation. The British had used it during the Bakufu or the, uh, the Tokugawa uh, regime era um, of the earlier 19th century for, for several years as their mission. And so it was already, um, there is already a tradition of using it to, as a rental for foreigners. And this is an era, a, a, an 18th century map of it. Um, they are over here on this edge, over here. But this neighborhood was particularly important because it was a neighborhood in which several important members of this uh, liter literatus circle um, uh, lived. In particular, this man. He was a scholar, a kangaksha, a hanshuja, a prolific author, and he lived very close to the embassy. And he, uh, it's interesting that these Japanese literatus people, after reading Chinese books, having a classical Chinese education from childhood on, had never seen a real Chinese literatus. And there they were right on your doorstep. And so they all started visiting, bringing treasures of Chinese culture with them, paintings, statuary, um, and so forth. Anyway, this was an important friend of Huang Zongshen who uh, helped him read Japanese historical sources, which he needed as background for poems he wrote about Japanese history. And notice how Chinese his even his 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 name um, of his of his uh, residence was an allusion to a Baijui poem. And they put together this collection of poetry, which I will allude to and perhaps translate a little bit of in the introduction to the book. Um, this is an exchange of offer an exchange, um, Wenda poetry um, between the Chinese from the legation on the one hand and the Japanese, their Japanese friends on the other. And it's quite poignant. Uh, I translate it as just time for a laugh. I think they realized how ephemeral their time was together. And here are the people involved. Here is the, the um, president or the ambassador himself, He Ru Zhang. This is the vice uh, ambassador, uh, Zhang Sugui. Uh, Shen Wenying was the third member of the legation and Huang Zongshan, the counselor. And then these others are um, other people working at the, at the Chinese embassy. Whoop, what happened? That's odd. I still have more, but I've lost it. Ah, I've got the wrong version. Um, well, I've gone on for about an hour. Perhaps this is a good place to stop anyway. And some observations back, let me back up some more about generalities, since I've, I've, there are a few things I remember that I had forgotten to mention when I was at that point. Um, this is a, um, approach to poetry, which is not just poetry, obviously, from what I've been, the, the, the scope is much, broader and involves uh, situating uh, poetry in a, in a historical context. It's a life and times sort of approach, which is very old fashioned. Um, and it's one which didn't please my teacher, Liu Royu at all. And I'd like to talk a little bit about him. Uh, Liu Royu, um, who died in 1988 um, at the age of officially 60, though he actually was 59 
there's an interesting story there too. Liu Ruoyu um, grew up in occupied Bei, Beiping during the Japanese occupation. And the only university open then was um, the Catholic University. And he attended that and did an undergraduate degree. Um, and then in 1947, he was admitted to the program for a doctorate in comparative literature at Tsinghua Daoxue. And his principal teacher was William Empson, who had come from England and was visiting professor at Tsinghua in those years. He, after 48, he returned to England. Uh, and James Liu or Liu Royu uh, learned his basic approach to literature and to poetry in particular from Empson. And Empson, of course, was the most famous student of I.A. Richards, who, though one might say he almost invented the new criticism, which invented, which uh, approached literature, you know, as literature, period. You know, that, that you understand poems exclusively from the internal evidence of the poems themselves. And it was a way to emancipate literary study from the biographical approach of the life and times, which so predominated 19th century literary criticism in the West, the romantic, you know, the poem is the man, the man's the poem and that sort of thing. Well, uh, Liu Royu really took this to heart and for his entire career, he was not a, um, he was he was a an unrepentant, unreformed new critic, despite his interest in phenomenology in his later years. And um, his his most of his works are are done this way. Well, I had come from a very different background with a lot of history, including art history, and I'm far more interested in the connections between literary expression translation of poetry and, and its presentation and the context from which it comes and the environment, the forces, the, you know, why it's being written and uh, to what ends and so forth. And um, we had a lot of interesting discussions, not all of which were all that friendly, as I recall, uh, uh, every once in a while. As far as um, uh, that I alluded briefly to the age at which he passed away. In order to qualify for his uh, British Consular Scholarship, which took him to Oxford University in 1948, he was one year too young. So he actually forged papers proving that he was a year older than he actually was. And so he was stuck with that false uh, birth date uh, information for, for his whole life. And he died that way. I suppose now it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. And it's hardly a confidential piece of information that means anything to anyone anymore. But uh, he confided that to me once. Um, so, um, so I do intellectual history, uh, sort of uh, philosophical context, um, as well as, as, as translating poetry as poetry. And I thought I'd set the record straight at that point anyway. So that's the one sort of backup thing I wanted to talk about. And perhaps now we can open up a discussion in, in general. Thank you, Professor Lin, for your interesting presentation. And uh, I just want to remind everyone that this is a project made by two PhD students. We do not have any funding. It's all based on enthusiasm and love for research and love for education. So our lectures also come without any money paid just to be able to share their knowledge. So thank you again for, for the help of Professor Lin. And now if anyone has any questions, you are free to raise your hand using reactions or uh, to type in the chat and um, 
I will give permissions to unmute yourself and we will invite you to talk in a second. I saw there was someone was showing that they want to talk something, but I can't find the hand anymore. If you allow me. Um, in the very beginning of the presentation, uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, in Japanese sources, they would use classical Chinese, but then they would use, change the word order uh, to make it closer to how they would speak in Japanese. So um, is it hard for someone who only knows classical Chinese to read such sources? And if it is, like, is there any way to start with the topic? Well, uh, I have several general observations. For people who already know how to read Chinese, it's extremely quick, and I'd almost say easy to learn to read modern Japanese. Um, as part of my odd career, for 10 odd years in Palo Alto, California, I had a business called Corporate Asian Language Training. And I taught um, courses in Japanese to, among other people, the um, Hewlett Packard Laboratories. And a lot of um, people from China, from Hong Kong, Taiwan, um, worked there as, as um, engineers and research, research uh, scientists and so forth. And the Chinese in my classes learned to read Japanese very quickly because the kanji, the hanzi, uh, with a few odd variants are the same. And much of the vocabulary is the same. And I recommend that uh, people try to do this uh, who have a Chinese background because there's uh, a great, it's especially important for non-Chinese people like me who struggle with learning how to read these things. You know, we didn't get taught, you know, the Chen Zuwen, the, the San Zi Jing and so forth as children. You know, I started Chinese when I was almost three days short of my 21st birthday. Um, and I've been working at it ever since. Um, it's very helpful to people like me, more so perhaps than, than native Chinese speakers and people with, a, with a, um, uh, at least a good component of traditional Chinese education. Um, the, uh, I don't know, does that, does that help? Uh, it, or what I had up on the, on, on the uh, let's scroll down. For instance, this is a Japanese, um, more or less pre-modern classical Japanese translation of the line above it. And what it does, it, it oh, these, these, um, if you're not familiar at all with Japanese, these, the kana, the jameng, the, the syllabary, the Japanese syllabary um, uh, elements. I remember when I was teaching uh, Japanese to Chinese at the Hewlett Packard labs years ago, do we really have to learn those funny things that are the squiggly little marks in between the, the Chinese characters? And I said, well, that's where the, where the grammar is carried, where, you know, where it's either an affirmative or negative, it's either a statement or a question, it's, it's either a you know, present or a past tense. It's, you know, it's, if it, it either says, if you do this, it'll blow up. If you don't do this, it won't blow up. You should know the difference. And so uh, they, they started taking this seriously. So, you know, you have this in effect attempts a grammatical um, parsing of the Chinese text which is, of course, very helpful. There. OK, thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat, and I will read it aloud 
Um, I noticed that Huang Dunxian used the universal form of heptometric portraits, Qi Jue, in his poetry collection. Yes. I wonder if it was a deliberate option by Huang, depending on the specific themes or poetic style. Yes, yes, it is. Um, I guess we'd call this kind of poetry reportage, reporting. It's, it's to get across factual material and it has very much a narrative thrust. And um, seven syllable lines are far better for narrative than five. And I'm sure he chose this form largely for that reason. Okay. Um, okay, we have another question. So from Kirsten Storm. Okay, um, I will be reading it. Um, so thanks for the inspiring talk. I was wondering whether Huang Junxian has written poems on other countries, cultures as well, on the US for instance, since he stayed in San Francisco for some time as far as I know, thank you. I don't know of any poems that he wrote in San Francisco. When he became um, counselor at, in um, London, he joined the, the Imperial Chinese Legation in London in, um, in 1890. He uh, traveled in Western Europe extensively, briefly, but extensively. And he has a very famous poem on the Eiffel Tower and railroads, as he did in or the railroads. He wrote about railroads in Japan too. Uh, when he was in San Francisco, he um, uh, was very, very busy apparently. He, his main job in San Francisco was the repatriation of Chinese laborers who built the railroads and who got stuck there after their term of indenture they had no way of getting home. And because of the um, Asiatic uh, Exclusion Acts and the hostility, many wanted to go back to China. So he was greatly involved in that. Uh, we do know about some of his attitudes towards um, um, life in the United States, not much, but one telling feature, it's rather interesting. Um, he didn't think very much of the American government. The, the Grant, this is Ulysses Grant, the, the Civil War hero, he was president at the time. And that apparently was an incredibly corrupt um, um, presidency uh, with a lot of scandals going on. And he thought very little of it. And that's all I can tell you about the San Francisco experience. He had a very interesting uh, diplomatic career after San Francisco and before London, he was consul general in Singapore. And there's a lot of information about him in Singapore and where he is also studied um, there. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. And I was actually about to ask something very similar. Uh, so, wonderful lecture, thank you. You seem to be striving for accuracy, but isn't poetry all about ambiguity? Could both versions of the poem you cited about swallows be correct? If so, how could that possibly be conveyed in English? Well, that's, that's a really unanswerable question. Um, one has to go for the most likely interpretation and to arrive at what most unlike most likely means of course it involves experience as well as specific uh, knowledge and i've always striven for trying to find a syntactic equivalence you can't write english poetry of English translations using Chinese word order. Even though the two languages share a common feature of subject verb object, that's the basic type 
of of word order. Um, nevertheless, uh, there are other features of grammar uh, that separate the two languages completely. Um, but there are ways of construing translations that involve searching for and and one hopes finds a syntactic equivalence. And you have to work at the most likely. And um, otherwise, what do you do? You, you put down two versions of every poem you translate. That seems, sounds kind of silly. Um, which ones, and that and it must be subjective judgment in the final analysis of the translator. Does that help? That's at least it's an opinion. It's hardly a, a definitive and authoritative answer, but it's an opinion that I've uh, firmly believe in. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. It's very interesting because. Um, Maybe not many sonologists in the West are aware of this, but there was this huge debate about the same topic in uh, Russian sinology. And there were those who were advocating for complete accuracy and grammatical accuracy. And uh, there were those who strived to keep the rhythm of poetry rather than uh, grammatical structures. And then mm. there was the third school that was all about translating the meaning and the feeling. And mm -hmm. um, as far as I know, it is still very big. So there are a lot of people who choose to translate meaning, uh, possibly not paying attention to grammar or some intricacies, but to the bigger picture. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if um, the goal of the translation might be important for the way one translates the text. So the, um, the ultimate goal of what one tries to achieve. So for example, one translation is more appropriate in an academic setting and another is more appropriate for general public, for example. Yes, that, that's a good point. Um, uh, the history of translation of Chinese poetry into Western languages is um, quite interesting. Um, when it was first done in, in English, which with, with which I'm more familiar, there was an attempt to turn it into what was domestication. It's to turn it into a kind of uh, a pseudo English form of poetry. And so you get, um, translators in the 19th century, a few who did try to do some of it, um, you know, essentially turning Chinese poems into English poems with using rhyme and, and all the rules of, of sonnets, for instance, that sort of thing. And then along came in the first, what was it, 1917, Arthur Whaley's translations began where he hit on a scheme that he followed his, his whole life. That is, he didn't try to rhyme, nor did he try to use Chinese word order, but his lines of English translation uh, had as many stresses as there are syllables in the original Chinese. And that worked for him. There is a downside to that, however. Everything he translated from the Shi Jing, the classic of poetry, to Yan Mei's poetry in the 18th century, all sounds like it was the, written by the same poet, because it all sounds the same. There's no individuality uh, distinguishable from one poem to the next, or from one poet to the next. Um, so I've, I've, I, I have no real, um, uh, how can I put it? Um, I don't have a rigorous uh, philosophy or methodology of, of translating, except to try to keep, I suppose meaning is more important to me. I'm trying to recapture what meaning the poet to me seems to have originally tried to convey. Um, and that makes, well, it produces one kind of poetry. As far as the, what, kind of audience you're writing for. I just concluded a, um, 
a long essay on the reception of Laozi in the West, starting with the Jesuit missionaries in the 18th century uh, through the contemporary uh, for a volume published by Springer and edited by um, uh, Liu Xiaogan, um, who is now professor at um, Beijing Shifan Dashia, though he is usually at um, uh, Xiangang Zhongwen Dashia. Anyway, uh, Professor Liu, you know, uh, thanks. It's a, it's a good essay and it will be published uh, probably in the coming year. And of course, the translations of Laozi uh, involves the same problem. For whom is it written? For whom does it appeal to? And there's an enormous difference between uh, uh, competent scholarly translations and those designed for the mass market. Um, and it's the same the same set of issues. Of course, you get you know there are more than fifteen hundred translations of Laozi into non Chinese languages, other languages. Fifteen hundred. That's second only to the you know the Bible, the Old and New Testament. And there's um, five hundred and some so called translations into English alone. Uh, most of which are translated are supposedly translations, but they're by people who can't even read Chinese. They are just uh, reworking something to appeal to kind of a mass market. And many of them are bestsellers, which for scholars, is kind of irritating. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, I believe we have no more questions and we have also run out of time. So I propose we end here. And uh, I just want one to- more. May, I, may I just yes. say one more thing? Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, presentation next week will continue and it'll be more specifically addressed to the actual poetry. So I have lots of, of poems to present and show you strategies of translation and so forth. Yes, this is great. So yet again, reminding everyone, we are meeting next week, same time. This is it, I guess. Thank you, everybody. And uh, see you next week. <laughs>